Good morning and welcome to Pilgrim Congregational Church, United Church of Christ here in Oak Park. Today is November 29th. It is the first Sunday of Advent and we are so happy that you have joined us this morning. We are an open and affirming church where all are welcome to join us on our journey as we seek to learn more from each other and understand more what God is still speaking to us this day. Thank you for being with us. Let us worship. Loving God, we open ourselves to you this Christmas season. As these candles are lit, light our lives with your imagination. Show us the creative power of hope. Magnify your love within us. Fill us with the kind of joy that cannot be contained, but must be shared. Help us to be peace seekers and prepare our hearts to be transformed by you so that we may walk in the light of Christ. Welcome to Pilgrim Online Worship Service, this first Sunday of Advent, November 29, 2020. My name is Neil Harriet, and I have the honor of being our liturgist this Sunday as we come together to worship. We come together as the sun seems to dim, as the moon fails, and as the stars fall. We come together as temperatures drop, as the winds blow, and as the snows fall. We come together as our anxieties, old and new, seem to grow stronger. We come together spiritually as we remain socially distanced. We come together looking for a sign, any sign, of what we believe and hope will come. We come together to help one another, to be aware, to stay awake, and to be ready for the change that is coming to bring us a new place of peace. 
Come, let us worship together. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. Dear God, help us to know how to welcome you into our midst in whatever way you choose to come as a surprising answer to a heartfelt prayer. Help us let go of old ways so that you can transform us and so that we can find you at work in our lives in ways that we do not expect or see. Help us to see that you are making all things new. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now please join us in the opening hymn, a rousing song of hope and expectation. Don't be bashful singing at home as all of us make a joyful noise. join me as we confess our sins to the one whose mercy endures from generation to generation. God with us, even in Advent, we confess that you can seem far away. You are hidden when we need you near. In our hurt, doubt, and fear, we do not try to draw closer to you. Instead, we lash out against you, our neighbor, even those we love. Forgive us, we pray, and come to save us. Let your face shine until our tears are dried, our sins are faded, and our hope is restored. After all, we belong to you, and in your hands we can be made new. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now, my friends, hear the good news. The grace of God given to us by Christ Jesus strengthens us to the end so that we may be blameless when Christ comes again. Thanks be to God who is faithful and has called us into the fellowship of the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Sharing the Light of Christ with Pilgrim. We, the Hagens, as part of Pilgrim's family, are sharing the Light of Christ with you during this Advent season. Good morning, I'm Jenny. I'm Nick. And I'm Kathleen. This morning we share the light of Christ with you. We light this candle for all who were apart from and were missing this season. We light this candle for family.
and we light this candle for the peace we wish to see brought forth in the world. Amen. supposed to be ready for? Sometimes I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be ready for either. My alarm rings in the morning and I think, what am I supposed to do today? Am I supposed to be going somewhere? Sometimes I don't even know what day of the week it is. Does that ever happen to you? I bet it does. I bet your day looks a little different now than it used to when you would wake up in the morning and get ready for school or get ready to go to the daycare, or now it's probably even someone different who stays home with you. All our days look a little different, don't they? Well, today I'm talking about getting ready for Advent. Today is the start of the Advent season. That's the time that we're waiting for what? That's right, we're waiting for the birth and the celebration of Jesus. Sometimes we hurry up, hurry up to wait, don't we? In the book by Dr. Seuss, Oh, the Places We Go, he talks all about a big waiting room. Did you know that if you're age 70, you've probably waited at least three years of your life has been spent waiting? Wow, that's amazing. At this time of the year, there's a lot of rushing and a lot of waiting. There might be a lot of rushing around depending on the kind of traditions you have in your family. But there's also a lot of waiting for the big day, the day that we celebrate Jesus' birth. God says that this is a good time, a good time to take a breath, slow down, experience the music and the joy and the hope and the love of the season and the beauty that is all around us. Our scripture today tells us that we're also waiting for something else. We're waiting for Jesus to return to the earth. Now, do we know when that's going to happen? We don't. So that would be a lot of waiting. So while we are waiting for that to happen, there are two things that we can do. We can wake up every day knowing that God loves us and find a way to share that with others. And we can also think about giving instead of receiving. That's another way to make the waiting a joyful place. So no matter how you wake up in the morning, by an alarm, by a parent, by a dog licking your face, wake up knowing that God loves you and your job today is to share that love. Let us pray. Dear God, the Advent season begins. The excitement and the joy and the walk that we take to visit the wondrous birth of Jesus. Help us to enjoy the waiting and the rushing together as we experience it in our pilgrim family here. Amen. Our gospel reading today is from the book of Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, then he will send out the angels and gather his elects from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. 
Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he might find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Pilgrim. It's such a pleasure to be back with you all. Every time I come back to preach with you all and worship with you all, it's just like coming home. And so I'm just grateful to be here, and especially on this Sunday, the first Sunday in Advent. What a treat this is. I want to bring you greetings from all the fine folks at Gather, including a bunch of pilgrim folks who are part of Gather. I want to thank you all for all the support that you've given us and the way that you continue to bless this ministry of Gather as it continues to grow. And I would not be a good pastor if I didn't invite you to come by our place tonight at 5 p.m. on YouTube at the Gather Austin Oak Park. A YouTube channel to see our Advent service. You know, we only do church one Sunday a month at Gather, and so we've got to get all of Advent squeezed into 60 minutes. I'm not sure we're going to do it. I'm pretty sure we will. But anyway, you want to come and be part of this service. It's going to be a very, very special time together this afternoon. And in the spirit of Advent and excitement about all that's happening in and around us, I ask you to pray with me before we go into the message. Come into our hearts, come into our hearts, Lord Jesus, come in today, come in to stay, come into our hearts, Lord Jesus. May the words of my mouth and the meditation that flows among and between all of our hearts be acceptable and worthy of you, O God, our rock and our rescuer. Amen. On Saturday nights in the late 1970s, early 80s, Americans sank into their sofas to watch The Love Boat and Fantasy Island. Two shamelessly sentimental shows where dreams always came true, love always conquered all, wrongs always somehow miraculously got righted. And as corny as they were, both programs were gems of escapist entertainment. We were all about escapism back in the late 70s and early 80s. A lot of us on the younger side didn't watch television so much, but we took the Bee Gees to heart when they told us we should be dancing, dancing, dancing the night away. And we jammed into discos where we grooved into the wee hours and then stepped into daylight half hoping that the world would not be the same one that we had left the night before. On Sundays, we went to church, where many of our preachers and musicians touched similar escapist nerves, turning our worst fears into palpable rapture. Jesus is coming, they assured us. The signs are everywhere. Can't you see them? Lift up your heads. Your redemption is drawing nigh. And oh, the songs we sang... Someday I'm going where Jesus lives. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. The king is coming. It won't be long till we'll be leaving here. And the song we heard earlier in the service, soon and very soon. What felt like a deep, dark night would surely break into a new dawn. There was the hope encased in all our dreams and fantasies and I suppose our denial that change was on the way. As the writer Shirley Jackson observed, no live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. And that's why back in those days, our televisions and nightclubs and our churches, even our advertising, pushed us to hold on by letting ourselves 
get carried away. The real was just too real. We hadn't fully recovered from losing the war in Vietnam and nearly losing our democracy under Nixon. Sixties ideals had dissolved into cynicism and in many quarters, determination to create change had surrendered to complacence. We were dealing with new humiliation as a nation when Iran took 52 Americans hostage. An oil crisis had cars lined up for miles just to get whatever gas could be had. The first major recession since the 30s destabilized our dreams of comfort and security. Even plans for college and advancement went up in smoke. And underneath it all, Underneath all of this strife, we heard rumblings of a new kind of conservatism, a chilling slash and burn mentality that idolized cash and sneered at compassion as a luxury we could no longer afford. So yeah, it was true, the sun and the moon had not yet gone dark and stars weren't plummeting out of the sky and planets weren't colliding in space, but still... An apocalyptic mood had seized our imaginations. A definite end of the world as we know it idea, and we did not feel fine. The highly charged language that's in today's passage, this bracing gloom and doom that encases unbridled, unseasonable hope that takes us from cosmic cataclysms to a blissful ingathering on angels' wings that promises our old, unfriendly world, scarred with greed and hostility, will somehow miraculously be made new. This language spoke to us in the late 1970s and 1980s. It speaks to us now. What interests me most about our present situation is how few escape routes are available to us. There is no dance in the night away in the company of hundreds of strangers. There are no big parties or weddings or celebrations to look forward to. Vacations are too risky to even conceive. And while we may have hundreds of Facebook friends, in real life there may be only four or five folks that we'll feel safe enough to be around in person. And so this text that starts with such a roar invites us to ponder escape as just more than getting away for a mental health break. What Jesus is describing here is a moment, what theologians and philosophers call a kairos, when what occurs is so utterly transformative, nothing can ever be the same. Now, that just sounds maybe a little too grandiose for the hardcore reality testers among us. Except, Kairos moments happen all the time. They're happening right now. Our ability to worship together online is the result of dozens of Kairos moments. From the invention of telecommunications, to the advent of the home computer, to the introduction of the internet, and most recently and most gratefully, the long overdue Kairos when churches everywhere realize you don't need walls to be a high-functioning faith community. The printing press a Kairos moment, the atomic bomb, a Kairos moment, Rosa Parks, the fight for the ERA, Stonewall, Me Too, George Floyd, Kairos moments, COVID-19, a Kairos moment. And of course, Shirley Jackson was right. She tended to be right about a whole lot of things. Escapism does keep us sane, but she only got half the story. Stepping out of reality for a few moments empowers and strengthens and enables us to re-enter it with fresh eyes, with renewed hope, with greater expectancy. In the late 1970s, the possibility of Jesus coming back was more than wanting to be snatched out of our misery. It was an innate craving for a Kairos moment when justice and kindness and mercy, when all of our better angels took charge and gathered us into a place of refuge. When we read Jesus' words in Mark, it's just too easy to dismiss all the apocalyptic talk as crazy, fantastic escapism. Our cinematic imaginations reduce his words into a cheesy disaster movie. 
That's why so many of us roll our eyes anytime the second coming gets mentioned. We fall into the same trap that ensnares so many other die-hard, nuts-and-bolts fundamentalist Christians. We assume Jesus intends all this to be taken literally, that he's telling us to keep our eyes glued to the skies and watching for any quaver among the planets, he, that he's telling us somehow or another to be afraid, to be very afraid. But his followers heard and understood something completely opposite. First, they knew what we should know. Fear simply doesn't belong in the Jesus toolbox. He built his ministry on assurance and acceptance and confidence that in the end divine justice will reign. The kingdom of God is near, was his opening salvo, and he never departed from that conviction. Second, the disciples were very conversant with end-of-the-world rhetoric. As David De Silva demonstrates in his book, The Jewish Teachers of Jesus, James, and Jude, by this time, apocalyptic ideation had become a defining trait of Jewish thought. The book of Daniel and many texts in the Apocrypha overflow with catastrophic images, but none of it alarmed their readers the way it often alarms us. Instead, it brought them comfort. Because in those stories, they discerned extraordinary, life-giving hope. Something was about to break. Hope was going to rise up out of the ashes. The stresses of struggle were going to shatter structures and systems that had held them back. Removing the fear factor from this text then aligns this end game that we hear today with how Christians imagined the beginning. Recall the angel's words to Joseph in his dream, to Mary in her, in her bedchamber, to the shepherds in the field. They all hear the same counsel. Be not afraid. So Jesus isn't trying to scare anybody here. Instead, he's calling us to embrace a defiant hope an overriding confidence that regardless how crazy and grim things may seem, something greater than we could even imagine, that we could get our heads around, is taking shape in and around us. And that's the good news for today, which requires getting past all the special effects to discover the real hope hidden in the promise of Christ's return. For any of the truths that we claim as Christians, any truth we claim as Christians to work, we have to trust a God whose power and love make anything possible. For anything we say as followers of Jesus to have meaning, it has to be based in trust in a God whose power and love make anything possible. Anything so could Jesus come again? Will he come again? Why not? Why not? A God of unlimited possibility makes that belief possible. That's all we have to recognize. That's plenty to hang our hope on, not on the exact nature and time of the event as so many before us have done. Jesus already told us the specifics were not known to us. Only God has the details. So all of those stellar pyrotechnics are there simply to grab our attention so we don't miss the arrival of the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. In other words, the arrival of someone whose uncontestable authority represents a force beyond nature to set things right. And then, as liberal, radically inclusive believers, we have to love what follows. Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes, he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. And I ask you, who lives in those places? Who lives on the outskirts, at the farthest regions, in the margins, at the ends of the earth? This is the language of reclamation, of outcasts and radicals, of people so far from center that angels must be dispatched to gather them in. In his commentary on Mark, Ched Meyer says the scope of ingathering is one from the end of creation to another. Mark envisions the renewal of everything in the universe, the dawn of a new world now that the powers have been toppled. 
This newness, this new idea gets reinforced in the short fig tree parable. New shoots mean summer. The long cold nights are ending. The chill is thawing. New life is coming into the world and what once was gray is now green. And it's going to happen so quickly, Jesus says, we'll miss it if we're not watching for it. That's why he says in verse 30, 35, keep awake, stay alert. And we should note the real sense there is something closer to shake off your sleepiness. You see, there's more in this text to being woke than the current sense of calling out injustices and wrongs and canceling folks you don't agree with. What Jesus is calling us to is less about wokeness and it's more like aliveness. A realization that God makes anything possible. And this kairos that is called 2020 creates an invitation to look up and realize there's more to what we're seeing than meets our eyes. And when we embrace this moment, our craving for escape turns into profound expectation. An inbreaking is underway. Something is coming. There's, that's the whole essence of Advent, isn't it? That's the point behind the hymns and the rituals and the candles and the recitations. This journey back to Bethlehem is a reminder that our journey is far from over. And that's where our hope is anchored. Not in the, the certainty of it, but in the uncertainty of it. Not in the idea that we've got it all figured out, but that we just don't know. That's where our hope is anchored. That's the intuition that tells us this dark night of struggle will give way to a dawn when our trust will be rewarded. And justice will summon the outcasts and the radicals and everyone in between into a new way of being. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. It may be hard for some of us to imagine, but is it really too hard to believe? Is it any harder than believing a God of boundless love and grace, an infinite God, could enter the world through the tiny heart of a newborn? So yes, let's tell that story. Let's tell the Christ child story. Jesus has come. Let's tell the Christ today story. Jesus comes to us day after day, moment by moment. But let's make sure we tell the whole story. Christ is coming. Christ is coming. Soon and very soon, we're going to see the King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hope is a prayer. Hope is a protest. Hope is a reminder that darkness will not win. A couple of nights ago, I was uh, watching TV and the former First Lady of the United States, Michelle Obama, was being interviewed. And she said that it is so easy and lazy to lead by fear. It is much harder to lead with hope. And that reminded me of Advent. Because Advent helps us to look toward the future, that time that we know as Christmas when Christ will come. And for us, Advent is a reminder of the hope in Jesus. And that Jesus will come and bring love, joy, and hope. And I would add justice, that justice will be born, and justice will triumph.
I invite you now to join me in prayer. You're welcome to share your prayer joys and concerns online during this service in the chat. Just be aware that they are publicly viewable. You may submit them through our website or contact a deacon for healing prayer by phone. Please pray with me. Holy Presence, we open our hearts today to the light and the darkening, to the wisdom and the wondering, to the now and the not yet of your presence. Guide us into this new season, for we are a people on a journey, often afraid of the unknown, often feeling alone in the wilderness of our lives. One of these days, God says, one of these days I will fulfill my promise. May it not be long, O God. We pray, gracious God, that your days of justice and goodness may come now among us. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of the Christ in our world and in our lives, may we find new ways to embody the words and the work of Jesus, that we might do our part to bring about your promises to all people. We lift up Alfredo, Walter, and all immigrants who have come to our country seeking safety, seeking peace, seeking justice. Lord, in your mercy and your grace, hear our prayer. We pray for renewed hope for all who are directly and indirectly impacted by COVID-19, for those struggling to recover and their caregivers, including Mary's long-term friend, Tiana and her daughter, Eleni, Sally's friend, Martha, Martha's daughter, son-in-law and grandchildren, David and David Jr., my friends, Gail and David. For the dedicated doctors and nurses working to exhaustion, risking their lives. For those who mourn and those who weep, the businesses closed, the jobs lost, the lives disastrously changed by diverted medical attention, those suffering from the sustained absence of human contact, Lord, in your mercy and your grace, hear our prayer. We pray for those among our families, those who we know deeply or only in passing, and even those we do not know or whom we dislike. We think of all who are sick, grieving, struggling with addictions and confronting hopelessness. May you comfort and heal them bringing new hope and vitality to all their living. We pray for Doug Swanson's father-in-law, Bob, that all goes well with his surgery and he is safe from COVID while hospitalized. For Erica, who is struggling with family problems. For Willie Mae, who is feeling under the weather. For Jenny's uncle, Carrie, who is in a nursing home and her aunt who is unable to visit and care for him due to the pandemic. For Carol's Auntie Fran, may she experience a painless transition into the next world. For Sherry and her family on the anniversary of her father's passing. For Sally, who lost a wonderful friend to COVID. For Wilbert's friend Thomas, whose sister died, grateful for our faithful church family to support them. For Todd Bowen and the memorial service for his beloved Lionel Smith. Lord, in your mercy and your grace, hear our prayer. Oh God, this year, this season has brought many challenges, losses, frustrations, and disappointments. But there is also good news, and we have much to be thankful for. We pray with gratitude and thanksgiving for the increasingly positive news of the possibility of a COVID-19 vaccine becoming available soon, for the effectiveness of Charles chemotherapy, for Bill Moore's good health, for Benny's contributions and leadership, and for Sue's faithfulness, love, support, and dedication being at his side unwaveringly, for the creativity, fellowship, and sustaining love of this pilgrim community. Lord, in your grace and mercy, 
hear our prayer. We pray with hope that this Advent season might make us a little more patient with ourselves and with one another. In this crazy and busy world, help us to see, O oh God, that we can make a difference. We prepare and wait, assured that the God we anticipate is with us, will be with us, and will not leave us. With joy and hopeful anticipation, let us now join together in community to pray the Lord's Prayer, each in the words most meaningful to us as individuals. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now this is the time in our service that we offer to give God a portion of what God has given to us. You are invited to give Pilgrim Congregational Church using any of the following methods, which you may be able to see at the bottom of your screen or in your online bulletin. You may give online at www.pilgrimoakpark.org, select giving from the menu, or check the Give to Pilgrim button. Via the Tithely app, that's spelled T-I-T-H-E, dot L-Y, downloaded from your phone's app store. Text the word GIVE, G-I-V-E, to 833-731-1098, or mail a check to Pilgrim Church. God is faithful to us. Let us be faithful in return. At this time, we ask that you give generously as you are able. Faithful one, please accept these gifts of our hearts and our hands. May they be multiplied and magnified as the living presence of Christ in the world. Amen. And now as our service for today draws to a close, I have several announcements to share with you. Our 2021 stewardship campaign is in full swing. If you have completed your financial and time and talent pledges already, we thank you. If not, please take a few moments to complete your online entries. We promise it is very easy. The links are on the website and also included in today's worship bulletin, which can also be found on our website. If you need assistance or would like to discuss the campaign, please feel free to reach out to Joan Petertill or Christine Vesley. And in that spirit of generosity, I would like to share with you a brief story uh, from a very generous anonymous gift that was given to Pilgrim this week. The story uh, comes from Delena, and I will share with you the email. I was at church this morning waiting for a stove repair and not particularly happy about that. He came at 10.15 or so uh, and did, said it was too much for him. Between 11.15 and noon, an elder white man, medium build, casual dress, looking kind of like a farmer, with fairly long, wispy gray hair, wearing no mask, was let into the building by someone while I was on a ladder trying to fix a light. He came over and just stood there. I climbed down and asked if I could help. He handed me an envelope that said, anonymous donation of $2,000. 
I thanked him profusely. And he said, I grew up in a local congregational church and because people are hurting and I'm doing pretty well, then he burst into tears and left. From that, I assumed the money was meant for us to give and not to keep. Thanks be to God, our Ministry of Christian Outreach is working on a recommendation for the best way that we can make sure that that money gets to some of those people who are hurting. Advent begins today and starting next Sunday, Pastor Colin and I will be co-leading a virtual small group devotion series that will last until Epiphany. We will meet via Zoom on five, from 5 to 6.15, mostly on Sunday evenings. Check the website for the very specific schedule. Uh, participants will need to purchase the booklet, Let Us Go Now to Bethlehem, Daily Devotions for Advent and Christmas. But you can get them. Uh, copies are available for $10 each here in the church office. So reach out to Pastor Colin or Joyce Lynn Fowler. This Saturday, December 5th, from 12.30 to 1.30, the Youth and Young Adult Ministry will once again be stuffing holiday stockings for the night ministry. To make sure we're doing so safely, though, this year we've pre-ordered all the stocking contents and we'll set up socially distanced stations in Fellowship Hall uh, for people to stuff them. We're looking for six to eight volunteers to help, and if you're available, please contact me. Uh, my email uh, to contact me to sign up. On Saturday, December 12th, we're initiating what will hopefully be a new Pilgrim annual tradition, a Christmas spirit event. All are invited to join the celebration of Christmas lights tour as we view the outside Christmas decorations of our Pilgrim members and friends. If you would like your decorations to be part of the tour, please register by Friday, December 4th, with Maureen Dale or Molly Knapp. You can reach them via email uh, so that they can make sure to add your location to the map, and you can find their addresses in the What's Happening with Pil at Pilgrim email. I hope to see you after worship today for our virtual fellowship hour and Tuesday night for evening prayer. The Zoom links are available on our website. And now please join me in singing our closing hymn. like no other, we have to go into this Advent expecting it to be a season like no other. We are going to all talk about what we're going to lose along the way and how our Christmases are going to be different, but I would encourage us, based on just this text today, to keep our eyes open, to remain alive to what God is doing and how God is showing up and how Jesus continues to come and will come again. And so now, may the grace of God, the love of Christ, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. 
Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen.